We are continuing in a series of messages today focused around the book of Exodus. We're talking about God's rescue plan for his people. And so I'm going to pick up where we left off last time. We are in chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 18. Just a little bit of a recap. We've looked at how Exodus is the origin story of God's people, Israel, and how we have seen how they are going to get their start, right? They have been enslaved in Egypt. And God is raising up a man named Moses. And we've seen his origin story as we've walked through this. What I want to do is pick up today with chapter 4, verse 18. Last week we looked at the call of Moses and how God came to him and said, I want to use you. He thought he was too old. He thought there was a lot of reasons why he wasn't the right guy. And yet God said, no, it's you. I want you to be the one to lead my people to freedom. Today we're going to pick up where we left off with verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now, this verse tells us a little bit of the dynamic that's going on in this family, right? He's going to his father-in-law and asking permission before he just leaves. That's interesting. It tells you a little bit of the dynamic of what's going on there and the fact that he feels he owes this to Jethro, to his father-in-law. There's a familial bond there. I mean, Moses has been there for 40 years, right? This isn't just something, some some guy he just met. And so, so here he comes, he asks for permission to go. And Jethro says, go, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. He's talking about the Pharaoh. He's talking about the the elected officials, right, there, or the the government officials there in Egypt who were seeking after Moses' life because of the Egyptian he had killed in his own ill-fated attempt to lead the people to freedom, apart from what God told them to do. They're dead. God says, it's time, go. And so Moses says, okay, he's going to go now. Moses takes his wife and his sons and has them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Up to this point, we've seen the staff that Moses carried, the shepherd's staff, referred to as the staff of Moses. But from this point on, because of what God did at the burning bush, because of the authority that he has invested into Moses, we will see the staff called the staff or the rod of God from this point on in the book of Exodus. It now has a different purpose, a different owner, if you will. This is going to be what God is going to use from this point going forward. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. You might remember last time, you can always go back and look at the the last week video. We talked about what God told Moses he had the power to do, things that God invested in Moses, right? He could take his staff and he could throw it to the ground and it became a snake. He could put his hand inside of his cloak, pull it out and it's leprous. He could take water and pour it out and it becomes blood. And these were the signs that, that God gave Moses the ability to do as a sign of proof that God indeed was sending Moses to do exactly what he was telling him to do. But here's a little bit of a preview. God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. I'm going to send you Moses and I want you to tell him to let my people go, to be free, to worship me, to serve me. But he's not going to do it at first. I'm going to harden his heart. And and for you, that may be for me, it's a a hard thing to to read. God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he makes the wrong choice? That didn't seem right. That didn't seem fair. And I think we have to understand this in the original context that it is said in. We're going to see as we go through this story that God is not taking Pharaoh's will, his free will away from him. God is allowing Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh wants to do. He doesn't want to let the people go. And so God is going to to turn him over to that. As the Apostle Paul would say later, he's going to turn him over to his sin. And Pharaoh is going to go down this path of not listening to God. And when we do that, we harden our heart to his voice. 
And so that was Pharaoh's choice. This is Pharaoh's decision. And what God is going to do is he's going to honor it. He's going to honor his choice, honor his decision, and allow Pharaoh's heart to do what Pharaoh wants it to do, which is be hard against his voice, against what he is asking. That's hard for us. But understand that you and I have the same ability Pharaoh did. We get to choose. We have the same free will. We choose if we will listen to our Heavenly Father and go in His ways or if we will harden our heart to His voice and choose not to, to choose our own way, our own path. Well, I know better. We have to be so, so careful. And I think this passage is, is, a, is a real warning for us because in many ways we are Pharaoh. We have the same ability to harden our hearts. And God will honor the choice that we make. God says, I will harden his heart. So he will not let the people go. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Remember that word in Hebrew means both serve and worship, right? Same word. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son, Pharaoh. And that's a preview of the last of the plagues that we're going to see in a few chapters. And we come to a very strange part of the book of Exodus. It's one that has baffled people for generations. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. What is going on here? The Lord met Moses and sought to put it. He's on his way to do what God said to do and put him to death. And the passage goes on. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And so he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. This is a strange section of the book of Exodus. And we have to wonder, particularly from our perspective, what's happening here? This is what I think is going on. First, we have to bear in mind that most translations, I think, get this wrong because they put Moses' name in here as though God met Moses along the way to kill Moses. That doesn't make any sense because Moses' name doesn't appear in these verses. We don't see it, even though some translations even insert it in there. His name does not appear in the verses we just looked at. The second thing we have to look at is this is really all about circumcision, which means that it's one of Moses' sons. He had two sons at this point, Gershom and Eliezer. And apparently he had not circumcised at least one of them. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. This was a sign that you were part of the people of God. If you did this, if you performed this, then you were part of the people of God. If you did not, you were not. You were cut off. And what's happened here is that Moses is going to go and he's going to be a leader of the people of God, but he hasn't gotten his own house in order. He hasn't made sure that the simple thing, the sign of the covenant is present in everybody in his own family. He hasn't done that. And so God stops him. God stops him on the way. This is not okay. You're not going any farther if you're not going to deal with this. And it reminds me of something that is, that is so true here. You cannot do what God says to do until you do what God said to do. If you haven't done what God told you to do in the past, if you haven't been faithful in that, he's not going to let you move forward to the next level. He's going to stop you. And that's what happens here to Moses. You cannot do what God says to do until you do what God said to do. Not only when it's convenient. Maybe, you know, a lot going on, Moses, a lot of stuff going on. So we hadn't really gotten to that yet. You're not obedient to God only when it's convenient. <laughs> you do what God says, full stop. You don't only do what God says when you agree. Remember Zipporah, is, she's a Midianite. She's not from the people of God. And this practice may not have been one she was familiar with or comfortable with. She might not have agreed with it. Maybe that was part of it. We don't know. 
but they hadn't done it. We know that much. You can't move forward until you do what God said to do, even when it's inconvenient or when you, you may not agree with it or when you think it's relevant. <laughs> maybe, maybe you think, that didn't really apply here. I mean, that was then, this is now. Be so careful here. Be so careful. Remember that you cannot do what God says to do until you do what God said to do. Moses got this wrong, and God stopped him right there on the way. And he would not let him go any farther until he got this right. Zipporah got it. She understood it. She took action. And again, you see a strong woman stepping in and saving the day, as we've seen multiple times so far through the book of Exodus, haven't we? Here's a poor steps up, she does this, and then, they're, then they go. Then they proceed. The text goes on, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron, Aaron, his brother, all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. They went into Egypt, they gathered together all the elders of the people, and Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. They responded. They heard what God said and they responded in faith, in obedience. They're like, we're in. God heard us. He sees us. He remembered us. He knows. And their response to that is their worship. Next, afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, this is their first time coming before Pharaoh, delivering God's message. Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness but pharaoh said who is the lord that i should obey his voice and let israel go i do not know the lord and moreover i will not let israel go now this is not an unexpected response god had warned moses that pharaoh would harden his heart his heart would be hard to the message and so it is. I will note that it's interesting that Pharaoh does ask the right question. Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? This name that God has given. That's the name that's here. Who is Yahweh? I don't know that God. We have a lot of gods here in Egypt. I don't know that one. And why should I care? Like, not only do I not know him, but I don't care. And he's not worthy of my time and attention, Moses. So why don't you get on out of here because you're distracting me and you're distracting the people from the work that they are enslaved to do. So stop it, okay? Stop it. Then they said, God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. They try again. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. You are distracting the people from what they're supposed to be doing. Moses, Aaron, shut up and stop it. Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many and you make them rest from their burdens. You're distracting them. They're stopping what they're supposed to be doing. That same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Straw would be used to help bind the bricks when they're making the bricks for construction. Well, now they're not going to be given straw. You can make your own bricks. They're making mud bricks. And, and straw is what helps bind the mud. Well, no, you go gather your own straw. Right? Apparently you got all this time on your hands to worry about going out and having a festival to God and leaving and worshiping Him. Apparently you got too much time on your hands. Let's fix that. Let's give you more to do. The number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. They're just lazy. They're idle. Let heavier work be laid on the men. 
that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves, wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday, as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. But he, Pharaoh, said, You are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Why have you done this to us? Why don't you go back where you came from, Moses and Aaron? All you've done is cause trouble. You've caused problems for us. And now our burden is heavier than it has ever been. You've just made it worse. Why have you done this? Get out, go away, leave us alone. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why? Why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. And we see Moses going back to his objections, you remember? Why even send me? Why did you bring me here? All I've done is make it worse. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. The Lord, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And this is going to introduce a section that's called the seven wills. And I want you to pay attention every time you see I will here. I'm the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Powerful recounting of the promises of God. Recounting going all the way back to Abraham, the covenant promises that he has made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and now to Moses and to the people of Israel. And God is declaring, I will do these things. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. They didn't listen. 
So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. If it feels like we're having the same conversation again and again and again, it's because we are, <laughs> right? God tells them to do something. They start to kind of do it, run into some opposition, come back to God. Why'd you tell us to do that? It made it worse. We can't do this. God says, go do it. But we can't do this. Go do it. But we can't do this. Over and over again. And they come back after God has given them these amazing promises, this section of, of amazing promises. And they come to the people with it, and the people won't even listen because of their circumstances, because of the burden and the slavery that they're in. In this section, I mentioned the seven wills. And the seven wills in God's statement of his promises is so, so important. In my Bible, I've underlined every one of those I wills. I would encourage you to do that. Underline every one of those I wills. This section has been called the gospel of the Exodus. That is the good news of the Exodus by Dr. Terence Fredheim, an Old Testament professor and scholar. The gospel, the good news of the Exodus, right here in just a couple of verses. Don't miss that. Remember what we've said throughout this series, that the Exodus is so much more about just being rescued from slavery, from oppression, from the burdens that they found themselves in. It's so much more than that. The Exodus is not so much about what they're being rescued from as it is about what they're being rescued to. They're being rescued to freedom, freedom to worship, freedom to serve. And we're going to see that theme running throughout this. But I want you to notice in the seven wills, in the statement that God makes here, the seven statements that he makes. I will bring you out of the circumstances that you're in. I will deliver you from this. I will redeem you because you are worth it, because you matter to me, you're valuable, and I will redeem you from this place. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. That's covenant language. I will bring you into the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you. You got three sections here, right? You got the first, you've got the promises here, the first three. That's about redemption. That's the promise of redemption because you're valuable, you're worthy, because I have declared it so. I'll bring you out and deliver you and redeem you because you're worth it. Then you get the second section of promises. These are about adoption. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. That's the promise of adoption that God is making for the people of Israel. And last, the promise is about the land. I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you. Now, what's interesting to me about this is that in the original language, in the Hebrew, what this says is actually a little bit different than what we read in English. This is in future tense. I will. I will do this. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. That's not what it says in Hebrew. In Hebrew, this is all in a completed tense as though it has already happened. Every one of these is completed. When God speaks it, he says it, he is so certain that this is what's going to happen, that this will be done, that he makes the statements in a completed sense, in a completed tense. It's in Hebrew past tense, as though it has already been completed, because for God to speak it, it might as well already be done. That's how sure you can be of what God has promised. I brought you out. But we're still in slavery. I delivered you. But we're still here. I redeemed you. I don't feel redeemed. And yet God wants them to know. He wants Moses and Aaron to know. He wants the people to know. You can count on me. You can count on me. You can take this to the bank. I am going to do it. 
count on it. No doubt. Why is he doing this? Because he's rescuing them from slavery, from despair, and he's rescuing them to freedom and joy. This is all they have known up to this point. And it seems to have only been gotten worse since Moses showed up. But God has something better for them, something they can't even really wrap their heads around yet. They can't even imagine it, but God has something better. And the freedom and joy that he is going to bring, that he's going to offer to them, that's out of his great love for them. Because he is for them, not against them. Now, how do they respond to this? When, when Moses comes and tells them these seven I will statements, this completed action, this is going to happen. What's their response? Well, they didn't listen. They didn't believe because of their circumstances. And, and you know, I, I can relate to that. There are times when, when I, I read a promise from God in his word and I want to believe it, I want to listen to it, but my circumstances are so much louder and so much more present. And I don't. I don't listen. I don't believe. I don't step out in faith believing. For them, Pharaoh, Pharaoh was so much bigger to them than God was. And in my life, sometimes the circumstances are so much bigger than God is, in my perspective. But you know what? That's just not true. God is greater and bigger and better than anything I can imagine. He's bigger than any circumstance I find myself in. And he can be trusted. That's the point of this section. That's the point of the I wills. For Moses and Aaron and for the people to understand that despite what you see around you, God's about to do something. And it is going to be talked about for thousands of years. It is the moment freedom is born for this people. The moment the nation will be born. You just got to believe. You just got to step into it. You got to show up. Because God is showing up. The question that I think they're wrestling with, and that I think we wrestle with too, is how hard is it to trust God's promises? And believe that he is for you. All they can see as they look around is more reasons for despair and discouragement. All they can see as they look around is more reasons not to trust God and believe. Why is anything going to change? Why isn't it always going to be like this? I mean, it is now. Why should I believe anything is going to change? Why should I believe anything is going to be different? How hard is it to trust God's promises? And believe that he is for you. And this is why I believe it is so important to dig back into books like Exodus. And learn what has gone before. What God has said. What God has done. Because in his past words and in his past actions, I can draw confidence in future for my present and for my future. God was so confident of his promises to the people of Israel. That he spoke them in the past tense as though they were already completed. What is God saying to me? What is God saying to you through his word? What is he promising? The writer of Hebrews says that all of God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. What is he promising? Have you, have you, have you begun to take God's promises and personalize them for you? Because so many of them so many of them are so applicable. Do you ever feel alone and discouraged? Do you ever feel like, like nobody is on your side? Remember what God promised. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll hold on to that one tight. Maybe it's what the Apostle Paul said. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for you. And with God on your side, no one can oppose you and win. These promises, these statements that I see in Scripture are ones that I read and I bring home. These are the ones that I remember on those days when I'm tempted to feel alone, when I'm tempted to feel discouraged. 
God is with me because he promised he would never leave or forsake me. And that's as good as done. I know it's true because God promised it. And when God promises it, it might as well be said in the past tense. It's that, that sure. I'm that sure it's going to happen. And God is that sure that it will happen. What are the promises that God has for you? My challenge to you through this book is that you don't only see this as a history lesson of what God did in the nation of Israel when they were in Egypt and coming out but that you begin to see what God wants to do in your life as he brings you out from the slavery and despair of what has trapped you in your past, the limiting beliefs, the mindset, the chains, the addictions, the shackles, the relationships, so many things that have held you back that you know are holding you back. And into that, God speaks to you an invitation to an exodus of your own. An invitation not just to be delivered from something, but to be delivered to something. To freedom. To joy. To peace. This is what your Heavenly Father offers to you. And that's what I want to pray for you right now. That you would accept His gift. That you would receive what He is holding out to you. The gift of freedom from what's holding you back. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I believe every one of us struggles with disbelief. Every one of us struggles with doubt. Every one of us struggles with being overwhelmed by our circumstances, by seeing Pharaoh as being bigger than you in our lives. When we see our circumstances as as bigger than you, then we tend to doubt you. We tend to doubt what you've said doubt whether it can ever come to pass. My hope, my prayer is that as we go through the Exodus, we will see a much bigger picture of you than we ever have. That we will see how much bigger and greater and stronger you are, have always been, and always will be than anything we face. Father, may we See your promises, not just for the people of Israel, but understand that you have promises for us as well. And may we receive those and hold on to them tightly, remembering what you have said. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are our Heavenly Father. And you created us and designed us on purpose, for a purpose. How great is the love you have for us that we should be called children of God. May these promises resonate deeply within us. May we remember them when we struggle and may we live into them this day and every day. And I pray all of this for each one of us in the name of Jesus. Amen.